Hi everyone, welcome to our seminar, our DFP seminar series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my name is Aline Silva, I am the DFP facilitator, and we would like to start with the acknowledgement of this land. So I would like to acknowledge that the DFP offices and classrooms are located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Muscan people. Traditional recognizes the lands traditionally used and are occupied by Muscan people or other First Nations in other parts of the country. And so generation to the generation and unceded refers, refers to land that was not turned over to the crown by a treaty or other agreement. We encourage you to take a look in this uh, links here below and also take a look at the map of native to see where you are located, where you live, where you play, where you work. So uh, after this, I will hand over to Don Wook. He is our steering committee, our seminar steering committee chair, and he will introduce. Yeah, thanks thank for coming again. Uh, and thank you for the land of the line, uh, Bellini. Uh, this year, again, we have three teams. Uh, in the last talk by Christina, we have covered uh, theme two. This time, uh, it's going to be theme one and three kind of mixing together. Um, because MC, I believe, going to talk about our embodied impression of research, which is really, really uh, interesting. Um, there are some upcoming seminars uh, next month by Selena Amersh and, uh, and December Team Overlander. Uh, Selena's talk will be about human AI interaction in general, a little bit more toward a theme two. And the team all in this talk will be about team, uh, team one and three. All right, um, we have Joanna McGreen here to introduce our speaker today, MC. Joanna, take it away. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. Greetings here from, uh, from Toronto. Um, so it is my, <laughs> yeah, from it's my great Toronto. There you go. It's um, sabbatical. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure today to introduce MC Schreifel, who's a professor in computer science and human performance at the University of Southampton, UK, where she actually is. Um, she's not in Fiji or on a beach or whatever. Um, she heads up, uh, she's the director of the Wealth Lab, spelt W-E-L-L-T-H, so not to be confused with this kind of uh, wealth. Um, and despite the fact that she's in the UK right now, uh, what many of you may not know is MC is a British Columbian. Um, so MC did her PhD at the University of Victoria. So virtually welcome back uh, through this talk. Um, and I'll say that I first met MC over 20 years ago now, uh, when I was a PhD, yeah, PhD student at the University of Toronto. Uh, and MC came out directly post PhD and, and did a stint at, uh, at U of T. And I remember like right from the get-go when she arrived asking the tough, the deep, the probing, uh, the salient uh, questions and always really, really uh, engaged. Uh, and since then, she's gone on to do stints at uh, top places like MIT and Microsoft Research and um, sometimes multiple stints uh, there. Uh, as I say, today she's at Southampton and the mission of her wealth lab uh, is to probe on the question how do we design, design, so great connection with the DFP, um, to help make normal better or to make a better normal? Um, and her approach is embodied interaction. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what that entails today. So uh, a warm welcome to you. Thank you for, for joining us today. It is a pleasure and I'm going to try to share my screen again and I'm not sure if that's working. It should. There we go. Is it sharing? It. Yep. Yay. Okay. So, um, well, let me just jump right in. And for those of you with your cameras ready, we're hiring. So if you feel like having a jump over as a postdoc or research fellow in the Wealth Lab after you hear this talk, um, talk to me about it. would love to spend some time uh, 
with you uh, ex <laughs> explore the fjords uh the, no i'm just kidding anyway but but do think about this so what i'd like to take you on today is more of a of a journey it's the first time i've kind of presented it in this way with you and i wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to share these ideas with you get your feedback and, and thoughts on them and see what we can collaborate um, around if the, these ideas are, are catchy for you, you think they might be useful and, and usable for you. And because really the question is, is when we look at, at how do we design the future work, which is which is a question that's it's coming up more and more, almost as much as uh, human-centered AI, we, we need to ask where, where do we fit into this? What are we trying to do? What problem are we trying to solve? here and so i'll give you some takeaways right now and so you can check at the end of the talk did you get this out of it did you spend these minutes that you'll never get back so that you got some value from this uh, proposition and uh, what i'd like to offer you is, is what is a the a first part if you will not the whole nine yards but at least a working section about what embodied interaction is in terms of why we could focus on the body some points of how we can use that in our design for design and validation of design and a concept we call tuning and uh, an approach to actually explore this idea of tuning this alignment of ourselves with our contexts. So I hope that will make sense by the end of the talk, but I just wanted to queue up some terms as targets that you could think about while we go through this. And again, your questions are, are, are welcome. So again, to, just to come back to a little bit about what the, the Wealth Lab was designed to do is really to ask the question around what problem is it that interactive technologies are trying to solve, especially when the locus of the question is around how can we support ourselves to be the happiest people that we can be, have great quality of life and be able to support doing that for all at scale, which is where the question about how do we make normal better uh, is is that normal you can think of as a statistical norm you know where is the average and the average at least in the uk and the us for many conditions from health to well-being to quality of life the average is tending towards disease towards illness we have metabolic syndrome all these things that are called lifestyle conditions they're not lifestyle conditions they're life infrastructure conditions. And uh, what we'll see is that the technology from workplace to others con contexts, but we'll look at work in particular, seems to facilitate leading to those conditions that, uh, or lifestyles. It's difficult to push a rock up a hill by yourself and not have it come back on you. If you're trying, if you're the only one that's trying to resist the status quo that is non-healthful, it's really difficult. Ask somebody who's trying to get uh, sufficient hours of sleep a night, and they might tell you, well, I, I can't possibly do that and look after my family and get up in time to go to work. That's a problem, and we know it's a problem. So what can we as HCI designers do about it to help make normal better? What, what, that's the kind of direction of the orientation, but the question then is, okay, how do we get there? What's, what's our map? And the reason that I kind of like this map of, of uh, California in particular, as a nearest neighbor um, below you guys, is uh, that it's so wrong. You know, it was an initial go at a territory. And this is why something that HCI designers can offer is the notion of co-design and iteration around a design. So I'm not saying that I have a solution, but I have a strategy, a starting point, at least to begin to map a territory that we might want to explore together. And I think it has something to do with this, with the body. And the body is not unfamiliar territory to HCI, but it's usually framed as um, everything is mediated through the body, social constructions and so on. But it's, a, it's an embodied approach in terms of looking at strictly you know, what, what, is, what is the body's interaction in a context? There's some work more recently with Kia Hooks uh, looking at that, the kind of affect, not just uh, Ross Picard's around affective interaction, emotional interaction, but, but how, in, in, you know, touching the body, being connected to the body actually could be a form of interaction or is a form of interaction. How is that used? And I guess I'd like to suggest there's, there's a way to probe a little deeper as to why might that vibration actually have the effect it does. So 
the question then might be, okay, great, Trafel, you're interested in the in physiology or neurology, super, what's that got to do with HCI? And that's a good question. And it's one I've actually been struggling with. It's like, I know I'm very interested in this, but how do I make this connection for people? And I think what we might want to look at is uh, why this is interesting is, is that the state of our bodies affects everything we do and how well we can do it. And I, I do um, lectures a lot for different organizations just around stress and how stress is, is not necessarily your fault. Stress is physical, it's not just a mental thing. It's before it gets mental, it's very physical. And it, and it seems that that's helpful for a lot of people to understand how to impact stress as a physical response that can be mediated equally physically. This is why people say, if you get nervous before a talk, you know, breathe, well, why? What's that doing? Well, there's a physiological process that's going on that is having this cognitive effect on enabling one to cope with that kind of performance anxiety in that context. How does that work? Well, actually understanding a little bit about how that works can help us design better, I would argue, and, and try to, to, to put that case, is that by understanding this kind of inner working, we can do better. But the body, and this is what comes back all the time, is, but I don't have time to go to medical school too. I will rely on medics to tell me about the body. I, I focus on designing systems and I totally understand that. So that's why I've designed this really simple model to deal with this awesome complexity. And this is a, a, the design, we'll come back to this diagram later, but it is all of the metabolic pathways that we know of it, uh, operating in our body. And we'll talk about that in a sec, but it's pretty freaking complex. And so I am daring in, in my own way to, to try to simplify this into an accessible diagram that even I can draw, which is a stick figure with three layers. And the way I'm framing this is that uh, the body is constructed in many ways in many disciplines. For instance, in medicine, it's the site of disease. And I mean that when you do a medical degree, the first thing we study is disease processes. And that's kind of the framing of the body in medicine is that, okay, how do we want to prevent disease? That's health. Disease prevention is often health. Uh, also where my background comes in sort of sports science as well is that the body is, is the site of enabling a physical performance. Uh, and and uh, optimizing its capacity to do incredible physical things. Well, okay. In what I've proposed, and that, that was really a, quite an aha moment for me, is, is that we can also talk about the body as the locus of adaptation. And that that becomes very useful in an HCI context or any kind of design and engineering context that engages with humans and, and our well being, which I hope to un unpack here. And just to, to refine that a little bit, this is some work that Eric Heckler from um, UC San Diego and I did around the body is framed as. Uh, a focus of constant adaptation, that adaptation never stops. We're adapting, you're adapting to what you're doing right now. The body is managing all sorts of internal processes to let you have the experience that you're having. We're connected to everything. And so because we're in this constant state of interaction, something that, that we care about as designers, we can look at, well, well, what are the processes that we might wanna understand about that interaction that would let us interact with it? And these three layers are uh, framed as first the, uh, uh, I don't wanna call it outer, but we just talk about our interaction with other contexts, which could be each other, an environment, a substance, an activity, that that is a trigger for an adaptive response. That next uh, adaptive response triggers something that in, is our, in our metabolism, which I'll unpack in a sec. And that is done, the reason our body is re responding internally to these cues, you know, you press on something here, something happens in the body to pr produce a signal in the brain that says, oh, I felt some pressure there and to respond to it to uh, determine, is that a friendly press? Is that an accidental press? Is that a, a sexual press? What's going on? Uh, the body is responding to that metabolically, doing some chemical stuff in order for it to be able to, in that context, maintain homeostasis. So if we just keep those three terms in mind of adaptation, metabolism, and homeostasis, we're kind of home free in terms of accessing the complexity of what the body's doing. 
This is one of my favorite examples of an adaptation, just to look at what that first part is, is this is Canadian Joan MacDonald, who is um, in, in certain circles known for her a fantastic uh, adaptation of her physical body in her late 60s to what you see on the right of her early 70s, gone from not looking particularly fit to being quite buff. And the, the uh, image below that of, on the rower is an example of one of the adaptation triggers that was used to create this transformation. And if we look at the metabolism and homeostasis connection, we can see why does the body actually go from one state to the other depending on the metabolic uh, or the adaptive triggers for the metabolism. Okay, so let's talk about met metabolism for a second as the system that supports adaptation. And if we had time, I would ask you guys, what do you understand metabolism to be? So if you think about that for a sec, you can see if, if what I'm talking about resonates with that. Metabolism is often discussed in popular literature as it's about energy. Do you eat carbs, do you eat fat, and how you get energy out of that? Well, energy is one component of metabolism. Metabolism really, as, as, a, as a word, uh, means change or transformation. So uh, something that's metabolically active is something that can be transformed. So changing fuel like food into something that can be used as energy is a metabolic process. But the other types of metabolic processes that happen in our body are changing materials decomposing and recomposing or what's often referred to as catabolic and anabolic processes that take apart components. For instance, if you eat food and it's stored as, as a, a triglyceride in the liver, it will break up into free fatty acids to be used in the bloodstream to be converted potentially into energy or into something to support hormones or transport system. That's another metabolic process. And then finally, the third type of metabolic process in the body is recycling. This used to be referred to as waste products, but the body doesn't have that many waste products. It tends to recycle more than it gets rid of or can't use or will put to other purposes. Um, so even fecal matter that, that is removed from our whole body is uh, in part doing a lot of microbiotic processes as, as well for that tissue. So it, it is a, a process that is triggered to support an adaptive response. So this is just an example that was under the slide about how you could dig into the cell, which is fantastic. I just, cells are awesome. And this, they're so tiny. I can't get my mind around either the billions of, of numbers or how tiny our cells actually are when we look at the machinery inside of them. And so this is an example of metabolism that would go on for producing energy in the cell using the little organelle. I don't think you can see my cursor if I'm moving over it, but this little part of a cell and even smaller part, they're actually aliens. This is our cells got together with mitochondria at one point to, to do this wonderful, amazing thing to produce energy inside of this thing, which has a little bit of its own DNA. Uh, which would call it an alien creature because DNA is, is, never mind. Anyway, so it does, does this cool stuff along uh, the inside of it to, to take in fuel, create some energy, then along the edge of it, even getting smaller, there are these microprocesses that, that create more energy along the electron transport chain that can be used by other processes, even within the cell itself, like the nucleus, to create new materials metabolize new materials for DNA strands to create hormones to tell our body stuff to do. So this is a, a metabolic response. And again, to go back to the Joan McDonald example, if we have somebody who's lifting weights and they have a demand on the body that is fatiguing it, that's costing it energy and, and we are energy conserving creatures. So therefore the response would be to that stimulus over time to say, I have to produce, build more tissue, in this case, muscular tissue, and that growth is usually referred to as hypertrophy, in order to be able to sustain the loads that are being asked of me, but in a more energy efficient way. And it actually costs the body less to recover from, uh, to build new muscle tissue and use that to take less effort to do these loads than it does to recover without that from the fatigue and exhaustion of the body if it didn't have that support to do that kind of work. So it's a type of efficient adaptation to save energy 
but at the same time, it has a lot of other metabolic benefits that I can't go into right now, but I'd love to chat about in terms of what it does for the goodness of our body. And we'll touch on that a little bit. And again, this is metabolism in terms of the processes of assembly and disassembly. And that one bit I showed you, what the reason I'm trying to, to show you this big picture is that that uh, process is right in here in the middle where I've got metabolic human processes, but that's just almost lost in the magnitude of how many other processes are going on in the body. And homeostasis, you've probably heard of, is again, the way of maintaining the internal environment of the body. So again, if we're working out really hard and we're breathing really hard, and we're sweating really hard, that is causing certain stressors and changes inside of the body to affect its uh, ability to maintain that internal environment. And so it's going to do everything it can, including asking us to pass out if necessary, to be able to maintain the correct internal temperature, blood pressure, oxygen or oxygen and carbon dioxide mixed gases. Most of the stuff in the body is, ra is ratios of stuff. And why is that important? Um, well, we don't want to die. And you see the the uh, the interesting thing, the relationship between this and, and uh, meta I'm, I'm not going to go through all the homeostasis stuff. It's fantastic. It's got my favorite cranial nerve, cranial nerve X marks the spot, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve that you hear a lot about these days. But the relationship to metabolism is that there's an interplay. It's not just metabolic response to maintain this internal environment of the correct temperature, the correct blood pressure so we don't explode. Um, and and this, is, this is why we die. <laughs> this is how you can defeat death, in fact, is if you can maintain homeostasis forever, you don't die. And so this is why aging is now being looked at as a disease. And there's a lot of research around re um, slowing down the aging process because it's, it's a type of metabolic decay where the metabolism can no longer function optimally to do that rebuilding and especially the recycling part. You might hear about autophagy in, in the common parlance, but that's, this is the idea of cellular death and how to clear out the, 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 the dead bits, if you will, or recycle them appropriately. And so um, why do we need that homeostatic environment? Because chemistry has to happen in certain conditions and metabolism is all about chemistry. And for instance, if you make something too hot, if you think about cooking meat, for instance, that's a muscle tissue. And if you raise the, the temperature of the muscle tissue, you'll notice it goes from being quite firm to very relaxed. Well, that's the same thing that happens to those proteins, that muscle on a very microscopic scale, that those proteins also start to change their shape. And the cool thing about communication in the body is that shape sends messages. And so if you destroy the shape of a particular thing by changing the temperature of the internal environment, it can no longer say the things it needs to say for the body to stay alive. I think that's really cool. And, and, I, and I hope you catch a little bit of that too, but that's all great. So why, why do we care? That's very nice, but how does this help us with design? Well, if we have this understanding that we're constantly adapting and, and why these processes are going on and certain processes are, then we can start to look at what I call tuning. Is that, and tuning is where uh, an instrument can be tuned to itself. Anybody who, who plays an instrument knows that, you, especially a stringed instrument, uh, in particular, you get a particular note, you use it to tune to the next note and you check its harmonics and see that it's all resonating beautifully. Then you can tune one instrument to other instruments so that they can sound good together, and get rid of dissonance. You can work around tuning around all sorts of physical properties for resonance. And of course, in terms of, of dialing in a radio station, or in this case, a ham radio station, by tuning, we clean up a signal to bring it in as strong as we can. And so that's what we're trying to do with our bodies and our interaction with other bodies. How can we do that using the body in order to collaborate as effectively as possible and make a beautiful noise, as it were? So for these resonances and alignments, what we're capable of doing when we're at our best. And one of the other things I think is really compelling about starting to understand ourselves on this molecular level as well is that the boundaries called internal and external are really arbitrary we're all connected to everything. The, the smaller scale we get, the more we know that, that, that the space between us is, is an illusion. And, and that um, might sound very 
uh, philosophical or mystical, but it's also very physical and very useful and usable when we want to talk about what's our role in the future of work. And we'll come on to this notion about balance as well. So how do we use this tuning? What are the fundamental notes, if you will, that we can use to tune? And the ones that I've been looking at over the past several years are what I call the in five and the C4, or the embodied five and the circumbodied four. And what these are, I won't go into the proofs behind these, but move, engage, eat, cogitate, and sleep are the only five non-invasive ways that we can affect our physical performance and that are fundamental. Uh, the death results uh, when we exclude them or we go crazy, you know, think about sleep deprivation or isolation. Uh, the effects of loneliness are, are bigger killers, loneliness, than all the, the lifestyle diseases put together. I was horrified by that statistic, but it's well supported. The other thing, again, about us being connected to everything is the, the circumbodied four here, gravity, air, light, and the microbiome. These are parts of our environment that we've evolved in that affect literally every cell in our body. And I'll, it, gravity is, is very interesting when we look at how we are oriented to gravity and all of our movements. Here's an example of how we're connected. Um, light is mission as it comes up as possible is, is huge. It hits our eyes, which triggers the relatively recently discovered superchiasmic nuclei, which then goes on to have an adaptive response to setting our circadian rhythm most, well, all of our internal organs have what these things are called clock genes that get synchronized by this process. When we synchronize to that process, that helps us maintain, that's a metabolic process, helps us maintain homeostasis of sleep. There's something called sleep pressure that affects when we feel like we need to go to sleep and also when we feel we want to wake up. And so when we do not have these connections to our outer environment, to proper light signaling, our metabolic responses can get screwed up and are therefore our homeostatic state around sleep can get screwed up. And sleep is really important, not just for rebuilding tissue, but for consolidating memory. And here's some great work by um, uh, Matthew, which is, I'll, I'll come, his name will come back to me, on sleep that says, when you're underslept, even by an hour a night, you look less attractive to people and people you're less likely to engage with others and they're less likely to engage with you. And that's no good if you wanna collaborate and produce great things. And, and so that's just interesting. So how can we design with this to be at our best, the whole body and embodied? Well, this is where this notion of tuning comes up. And the key question of tuning is how do you feel, how you feel better? In other words, we have lots of processes around us, but when we've been researching with folks, people don't know why they feel how they feel. They, or they do a kind of post hoc rationalization of, well, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Well, how do you know? And why not? And are you sure that's what was going on? Maybe you're not sleeping well because of, you're not socializing with folks or you're not going for walks. The N5 and, and C4, you can start anywhere, they affect everything. So they interact with each other. So what we're looking at here is helping people use the N5 and C4 to explore these, to start to understand how to tune themselves and tune interactions collegially uh, with each other. And we can take a look at one example that we looked at, which is in terms of sleep. And what is the normal pattern for sleep, especially associated with work, um, in terms of what is perceived to be normal. And this is where our technology comes in as well as an opportunity to reflect on that process. How do we go from, for instance, a current normal of feeling groggy when we wake up, not terrific necessarily, not necessarily raring to go, to wanting to feel refreshed, alert, awake, had enough sleep, waking up well, rested? How do we get there? And what's our design opportunity is how do we connect the processes that are positive with those effects, especially with other people being different. You know, I, I might need to cut back on my caffeine, but if you don't drink caffeine, maybe it's a noise issue. How do we explore that? So we want to put this in terms of tuning as a cycle, like tuning a guitar has certain properties. And we call these, the first one is, what are the knowledge, skills, and practice that you might need to know? There's stuff you need to know. To, to help you sleep better. 
But as we all know, just knowing stuff doesn't do enough. So how do you help somebody have an experience to trigger an adaptation about what they're doing so that they can then perceive that they're feeling better and make a connection between what they did, what they can do, what they can control and how they feel so that it's adaptable for them. So here's a normal example might be person ends up feeling groggy and they know they might not make these connections even that they have their technology, their normal skills and practices. They set the alarm that gets them up. It interrupts their sleep and they have to wake up and they feel like poo. Their experience within that cycle might be a restless night, might be a short night, whatever's going on, too bright, too loud, whatever it could be, but they're waking up for whatever reason and feeling not great. So how do we fix this? Well, we might offer them a heuristic that they can test. And we, we put heuristics as different than habits. Habits are very fixed and context specific. Heuristics are more general framing, but you still need to know what to do with them. Like Bear Grylls is a survivalist in the UK. He says, oh, to survive anywhere, you need to have protein, shelter, and water in that order. That's fantastic. But how do you instantiate protein if you're in the desert versus uh, in the tundra? So. This is why we need to know stuff. We, we did a, a piece of work called Experiment in a Box. This is again with Eric Heckler and my student George Merson. And uh, it talks about this, this process of how do you help somebody test something out? And this is a big part of the uh, exploration towards designing new technology is finding out what are the heuristics or the processes that work for somebody. So we had a simple app. Uh, this isn't what I call the best interaction in the world. You don't need an app for this, but we used it to make it more accessible for people and to guide the reflections a little bit. Where they are, we offered them a bunch of experiments that they could try around sleep, scientifically tested stuff, and say this works for some people. Does it work for you? Here's something that you can try and experiment in the box for five days. Do it. Um, and you never have to do it again, but just commit to doing it for this period of time. And we call one of them kill the alarm. And we were doing this with a company actually. And we asked their managers to say, is it okay for folks, as long as they get their work done in the day to come in at whatever time is comfortable so that they can wake up without having the alarm go off. And the managers were way more supportive of this than the staff who were terrified that if they didn't come in on time, there'd be social punishment for that. So that's where you, we got to think about culture in which these experiences happen. What we found out is that some of the responses we got from this were people saying, you know what? I've always heard that eight hours sleep was better, but I've never tested it. And this gave me the opportunity to actually test it and it's really working. And so the kinds of questions that came up about that is do I have to do it every night? Can I take a weekend off? What, what, what happens around that? But the point is, is that we're able to allow people to explore things, to find out how they work for them, in what context. And we can't design an app to fit every context, but we can design these kinds of frameworks to let people explore stuff. And in fact, that's our goal in this case to help make normal better, is to design technology to be useful and usable for a short period of time for people to build up the knowledge, skills, and practice they need without having to rely on an application. So it's this notion of testing heuristics to own the skills and ditch the app. Batteries shouldn't always be required. And what this also, again, comes back to us on is, is these notions of smart alarms, I'll just share this. There's no such thing. Anything that interrupts your sleep is interrupting your sleep. And if you're still asleep and your sleep's getting interrupted, you're underslept and that's just not healthy. So the, the next question to, to come around to this is how do we take this model and think about the future of work. What is work? How do we align our designs now that we've learned something about the body's physiology, how it adapts using its metabolism to maintain homeostasis, how we can use move, engage, eat, cogitate, or sleep, any of those things to tune, help tune someone as well as to look at what's the relationship to gravity, air, light, and the microbiome. Once we've got that, we can ask questions like, well, what about work? And the reason I've got this picture of the past, if you will, is that this is sort of 450,000 years of our evolution prior to the 10,000 years ago when agriculture kicked off uh, to say this is a pretty longitudinal study of what seemed to work. And it's very different than anything we've evolved right now, but it sure lasted for a long time in terms of the types of interactions that we see here of collaboration, problem solving, uh, time it, with rest, time with play, all these kinds of things to, we need to think about to ask the question, well, what is work? And I'm, I am not a work expert. There are great people to talk with to get to, to know more about the culture of work and how it has changed. 
but some of the assumptions about it uh, is what we want the future work to be. We've got the dystopian Wally -E on the one side and the utopian Star Trek as possible futures of work or non-work or work because it's, it's valuable, not because you need it for money. Uh, and you have this sort of way back kind of work that could be um, romanticized into a, into a sort of collaborative, collective wonderfulness. And then we have periods of transition in between there from the very recent uh, use of slaves uh, as, as a labor force treating uh, people and animals in, in the context of just a kind of machinery and putting people into machinery. And it hasn't changed that much. The, these two pictures, one is, is the River Rouge Ford plant that was famous around the 1914 period. And the other is 2014 Amazon. What have we learned? What are we doing? And yet, this is not how we have to be. This picture uh, on the left was actually taken in, in 2018, um, looking at how what we can learn from hunter-gatherer populations about health, well-being, and movement. And one of the outcomes of this study was, you think that walking 10K is what's good for you. These guys walk twice that, uh, and, and here's the quality of life. And if we look at examples of, of that and hold that the N5 and C4 up to our workplaces where we might design interactive technology like great tips to you know stand up once in a while is kind of where the Apple Watch might be at for, as a workplace intervention. We can start to see things like, well, where's, where's the light here? What are we doing with light? Is it uh, Sachin Panda, another collaborator um, at the Salk Institute talks about the intensity of light is important. It's not just do we have light that will defeat our connection, our connectedness to natural light, but the, the quality of light in terms of intensity is so bad and it's so imbalanced that it's also unhealthful for the benefits of actually having the intensity of light that you'd get if you were outside like we seem to be wired to do. Another concept I'd like to, to give you with here in terms of thinking about work in particular is to draw on Ursula Franklin, um, and I've been talking about her probably as long as I've known Joanna, is technology as a way of doing as opposed to a thing in itself. And what she talks about, for instance, in one of her examples is technology as a way of doing uh, like knitting and that how different cultures knit, and I learned a lot about different cultures knitting practices during lockdown, is how we identify each other. So our way of doing things is also telling us a lot about what our values are. And I think about this in terms of, and she talks about being designed upon in terms of infrastructure in particular, where do we have a voice in either urban or technology planning? When you think about the rise of the cell phone uh, or the mobile phone, the, the individuality of that rather than shared screenness of that, there were options there that were not explored. It's like, in whose interest is it Qui bono to go back to Cicero uh, uh, to say, uh, whose interest is it that, that everybody has their own phone? A lot of data tracking possibilities there. The, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was, was Walt Disney's biggest win of all time in terms of, again, knowing where their stuff was. Um, these, so this is a, a collection of essays by her. This is the first edition of the book of Ursula Franklin's book. Somebody proposed she should be on a $100 bill to re replace the monarchy. I won't touch on my Republican sentiments as a Canadian and living in the UK in this context, but suffice it to say that this is an interesting trope to consider when we're designing for work. What is our way of doing something? What is the way that we want to support a better normal. How do we engage with that? And that's the 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 Dow symbol for Dow and way. Just thought I'd offer that. So again, we're we're thinking about. I'd like to share also is that the brain is hugely wired to get how it does things well by movement. All of these areas on this image uh, are about areas devoted to movement in the brain and how the brain and movement helps us here. And this, this picture of this person doing a little bit of parkour on a railing um, is working a lot of areas of the brain, a lot of problem solving in here because movement is about a vestibular, visual and proprioceptive interaction for strength. You can't be strong without these things working together. And when they work together, they have tremendous uh, firing up of the brain and health and well-being. This on the other hand is not parkour. This is something else that we've designed, highly designed, well-designed to separate us from um, 
our, our need to move, to make us as comfortable as possible in something that makes us as, as sick as can be slowly. So is this the best thing we want to design? Is that our way of doing something? Again, this we know, uh, these greens are super good for our brain, our body, our well-being, our ability, therefore, to feel comfortable with each other. And yet this is what we've optimized in terms of cheap, fast calories, energy privileged over too much energy privileged over nutrition. Again, we come back to the environment. How do we connect to the environment? What are we doing in the environment? How does our environment align with or, or try to defeat our connectedness to the world around us? What does that look like as values? And I'll just offer this quickly, this picture of a medieval monastery. And again, this is my romanticization of it, but one of the things that the medieval monastery had going for it was that it was a, a teaching institution. It offered care for the community in terms of hospitals, especially for nuns before Aristotle got brought back in the medieval period to say that women shouldn't be doing anything. And uh, these kinds of examples show that it didn't matter whether a monk was specialized to work in the scriptorium copying texts or doing research. They also spent time out in the yard doing some, some work, physical work, and helping with that. Eventually, over time, there was increasing specialization even within the monastery, and this kind of got lost. But interesting, I, I should have a picture of that. Different types of religious communities in India and Africa still have that multiplicity of tasks where the community serves other communities in terms of, of teaching and uh, healthcare, but also does um, uh, gardening, learning, etc. So a question I have about the future work is, is do we want to be, still be as specialized as we are, where we're standing at the same machine all day, where we're standing at the same desk all day, where we're doing the same thing? Or is there value in trying to explore tasks? Some of the stuff we're doing, I'll just touch on very briefly here, is I'm very interested in, again, from, from our doing this kind of communication, is what's the special sauce that, that makes us being in the same room together more challenging for many of us uh, to be co-present with somebody, but also sort of richer as a result? And can we synthesize that better? So while a lot of folks are looking at better comps, better video experience, I'd like to understand the physiology of co-presence better so that we can look at what can we bring to that to potentially help where that loneliness could be defeated. How do we engage better with the microbiome, with light? Where does our technology of work take us there? Also in terms of augmented or mixed reality, we're looking at the fact that again, movement is so critical to learning. So that little bump at the bottom here of the brain, the cerebellum or the little brain, is we're finding it, it, it does a lot with movement. We've known that for a long time, but science is showing that it's also connected to communication and to learning and all sorts of coordination with the cognitive side of the brain. So my question is, can we blend that movement across an environment with augmentation? It doesn't have to be visual to support learning. And it's funny, there's this book, Movement and Learning in Spanish class, which is about how to get people moving in a Spanish class. It's not about using movement to learn Spanish better, which is what we're doing. And, and that's kind of cool to think about, well, how can we use technology to help augment, for instance, walking through an environment and saying, oh, that's a coffee shop. And how would you say that if you, if you said it in Spanish? And does that help you to remember the vocabulary more by engaging with that in the context of the environment and while moving? So there's some interesting, I think, explorations there. And again, the sense of, of uh, what we do, we cogitate all the time. We're constantly pushing ourselves to learn new stuff, to get better at what we do, but there's other types of attention and awareness that we practice less. And I don't mean uh, just mindfulness meditation because that's been a popularized thing, but it does mean looking at what are ways that, that we take a broader view physically, Peripheral vision, like I said, it, it changes. When we're stressed, it narrows. When we're working on a, on a short distance screen and our eyes are going bad because they don't do natural long focusing anymore, that induces stress. What are we doing to take that wider view, to breathe, to, to connect? How do we support that as part of our work process to be more creative? And some of the work that we were doing, um, again, a while ago with Ogilvy, they, their value is creativity in, and as an advertising company. And so our proposition was, well, if you do some of these in five things, you'll be more creative for free. And that's a promise we can offer anybody is that if you focus on these simple principles of interaction with the body to help it work 
on the meek, so the gammas are in five C4, guaranteed whatever it is you value, you will be better at effortlessly because your body will be in a better state to be able to do that. So just to review where we've come from, the, the question is how and where do we get to help make normal better for all at scale? And then the wealth lab that as Joanna kindly pointed out, W-E-L-L, -L, is pointing at the notion of well-being, health, um, in, in the UK, well-being and it usually gets just chucked into the basket of mental health as opposed to getting that, you know what, mental health is part of the body. It's affected by your physical well-being. The brain is part of the body. It's my mission to help people realize that. Uh, and so we can ask these questions of how do we get there? Well, this is where we are. We've got these damn chairs and everybody seems to know that sitting is bad for us. And yet where are the options? They, they will be value engineered out of a purchase situation to get a standing desk they have behind me or a treadmill. That's only a partial solution anyway. It still is very specialized, very focused, very same place, same time, as opposed to something that invites us to explore. We just finished a study looking at inviting people we had great little app to help people explore exercise for the first time in their lives at, at work the, our vc or um, head of the university said you can have 35 minutes a day because that was our, our our research line about how much you need to move to mitigate the effects of sitting for eight hours a day you can take it for free we'll cover the cost don't worry about it many many people didn't do it because they said i'll never get my work done if i take that kind of time off and it's like, wow, we have some work to do around presentism, around energy, around why this will help you work better in better time. Uh, it's not the paperless office, it's, it's, it's a healthful office. How, but again, that culture design, what's our role there? So yeah, burn the chair and move forward. And these are some of the heuristics that you have from that with the notion of how do you tune the body once you know that how it works and that it can be tuned and it's adapting constantly. I've offered a few inputs, the N5 and the C4, that can help with this adaptation towards working together better. Engagement is, is something. Why do we have facial expressions? Because we communicate with each other. It's, it's so cool. You know, this is how we've evolved. And so we can do this by looking at tuning as one paradigm for doing that, helping people give them the space to explore heuristics of, of the N5, of well being, and the C4, of the environmental effects taking the time to do that, creating that space so that they can own it and not have to rely on the technology and that we can look therefore at how we might engage with these processes that are fundamental, it seems, to earlier practices that might've been more healthful, not only for the individual, but for care for the community. Uh, and what do we value becomes a big question in this space. And I've asked that you consider the notion of technology design, not just as artifacts that you're creating in HCI, but to really ask fundamentally, what are we doing and what's our way that we want to do this? And how do we invite exploring that way together? So with that, I'll say thank you very much for that, that uh, rapid tour. Uh, and again, I, I so much thank you. Um, I guess people say that all the time, thank you very much, but I, I was really reflecting on the fact that you're allowing me to share these kind of ideas um, that are not necessarily, here, here's our latest application, but, but are looking at uh, perhaps a different way of saying, well, what if we use this as our model for, for founding our designs on and, and to take a chance to, to hear that. So I, I thank you very, very much. And I'd be delighted if not uh, the time to, to pursue that because it's like, whoa, you just threw all this stuff at me. And, and maybe you don't have time to consider questions, please feel free to use, use the address below and, and uh, right before midnight tonight, so you don't forget uh, to, to say, you know, um, let's chat. Here's an idea. Is this what you're talking about? Happy to. Okay, that's, that's uh, opening the floor, I guess. Thank you so much, MC. I'm doing uh, a round of applause <laughs> on Zoom, and those in the room can uh, can do the same. Um, so, wow. Uh, well, my my synapses are going to continue to fire up <laughs> for, for quite a while. Um, you know, lots to lots to absorb as usual when um, when you when you share and engage. Um, I've been asked to start off one of a big theme um, and partially in some of the funding we're getting in DFP is related to Jedi. And for those of you um, in the room and on Zoom who aren't 
familiar with the theme of Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, broadly construed, I'm going to throw this right at you, MC, and say, how does your work relate to Jedi? Um, well, and, I hope and that the, the work that you're doing, but also your broad yeah. framing of where you think we should be going uh, as designers. Well, I, I, I really hope that constantly um, banging on about values and ways uh, is, is reaching into the social justice question and to resist, as Ursula Franklin tried to resist being designed upon and opening up opportunities for um, co-design. And I don't mean us as designers parachuting into communities I, I, and then leaving once we get our little research thing out of it. Um, I think a challenge for our future work and in terms of if we really care about social justice, not least equity, diversity and inclusivity, but especially the J thing, which hasn't made its way across the water yet. It's a lot of talk still about EDI and that's very important in computer science where gender representation is so terrible. But in terms of the big J, it's delightful to, to hear that, is that I, I guess it's the, the sense of how, asking the question, what are our values? Who's the hour in our values? Um, to be able to make sure that we're, we're challenging that, listening, having, having an approach of, um, co-design, I'm not going to get it right first. There's in the UK and maybe here too, there's, there's a, this thing called PPI about participant, public participation interaction with, with projects in the health space in particular that are funded by health councils. And with how many communities are you really reaching out to? Um, how can you assess that to make sure that you're doing that? And what's the impact uh, and the longevity of the effectiveness of your work? And I guess for our community, and this is something HCI has been struggling with for a really long time, is we're not really good at longitudinal evaluations. If we focus just on the interaction, we can do very down and dirty in the lab short studies. It can be very valuable, but aren't necessarily going to have that kind of social value or impact. So part of being able to enable that if we look at the future work just for our own discipline is to start to ask how do we have mercy on ourselves so that we can do more careful and care caring research that is more considered that might mean being embedded in communities might mean thinking about challenging ways of actually valuing co-design as part of our process and being able to report on that rather than trying to get you know everything ready in time for Kai. So I think that it, we have to reflect on our own values and way of doing things and ask ourselves who benefits from this. Right now, that structure means that if people are successful at that and play that, um, they move forward in this box of our career. But that's not necessarily doing anything for climate change or for social equity or for um, you know dealing with with making our neighborhoods a safer place to be. So I, th I, I don't think I'm adding anything new to the, to the discourse there in terms of methodologies that, that we have available to us, but I think that we have to challenge ourselves to say, what would our future work look like if we didn't specialize as much, if we spent more time helping other people work in their gardens, if we did more time in, in community uh, projects or gardening and, and then spoke from enabling that. I, that. That's the sort of thing that we're, we're kind of trying to find a way to struggle with and support um, our postdocs around uh, doing so that, well, what's a publishable unit since that's our measure of success for right now, but will allow you to do this longer term reflective work. Yeah. So it's messy. This is a transition point. Yeah. I will we you. embrace it or run away from it? Yeah, I hear you. Very complex. Um, for sure. So you started it. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for that. I, I I could have a coffee conversation with you, but I've been told that uh, I should let it go to the folks in the room next in terms of questions. And as always, sure. we do want to prioritize um, our, our students. students and postdocs first uh, before opening it up to others. Right, so uh, thank you, Jonah and MC. Um, so here we have a microphone and we're gonna go conference style if you've been to in-person conference. So uh, if you have a question, 
please come up and then line up here. And then, you know, uh, in the order, we're gonna give you opportunity to ask questions. So feel free to come over and then ask questions. Go ahead. Uh, really great talk, Pepsi. Uh, I think I have a question about the embodied and embodied terms that you used in the beginning. Like I didn't quite get, get what, uh, how are you differentiating these two terms? And like why you chose the embodied terminology for your research rather than embodied, <laughs> like E-M and I-N. <laughs> yeah. Do you know much about the E-M type of embodied interaction that you're asking that? Or is this a new concept for you too? Uh, I know about embodied cognition. I work on haptics, so I, I read a lot about embodied cognition, but this term of embodied is new to me. I'm not surprised it's new. I'm sad that it's still new, but I understand why. So so what's your main take? How would you describe uh, embodied interaction to somebody in you know a sentence or two? Uh, something that is engaging with your body. So for example, if I'm touching a hot cup of coffee, and I'm feeling something, it's like a embodied interaction. Uh, probably like factors and things that I'm touching through my body affecting me as a person uh, through like physiological means and yeah, cognitions, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'd recommend taking a look at, uh, at, at a 1999, 2000 book. Now, Paul Dursch is um, where the action is if you haven't done that to look at the philosophy side of embodied interaction it started as a philosophical position about looking at how the body is socially constructed how it is extended or extensible in terms of when you use a tool in your hand this is heidegger with desan with the tool in the hand I, my body is extended to include now the tool and i'm working with that and what does that mean to to be moving in space and again this this source of embodiment that you talk about with cognition uh, similarly in terms of processing and understanding stuff. So in these cases where you talk about perception, et cetera, et cetera, embodied interaction doesn't really care about the mechanism of the interaction. It will say, here's the input, here's the output, whatever happens inside of the body is a black box. What I was interested in, I hope I demonstrated in the, this talk, is that it's valuable to open the lid of the box that we can do that, and that that opens up more design opportunities by looking at the physiology, the neurology, the kinesiology, the um, endocrinology of these complex systems interactions within the body itself, and hence calling it Embodied is a play on embodied to say we're going under the embodied black box to start looking at some of these processes to see if there's value there. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Um, questions? Or maybe, um, Jonah, we can take questions from the uh, people online or the Pepper members too. Not only students. I, I just want to check that you're not running over your time too much, too badly. Okay. Out of consideration for people's schedules. I'm not sure what you had scheduled for this part. So, so often I'll just say that um, we, we keep the talk and the, the first uh, bit of questions to the hour for anybody that has to right. um, jump out physically or hop on another uh, Zoom uh, session. Yeah, exactly. But often, often we do go over uh, a little okay. bit, um, but folks do know that they they are able to to take off should they need to. So, so here's my question, since I'm not seeing a bunch of people jump up, is that what are some of your takeaways from this? What are things that you might use from this or think about further? Hi, Monica, that was a, that was a beautiful talk. Um, I've been struggling to frame some kind of a question uh, for the thoughts going around in my head. And so this is a kind of a lame framing, but I'll give it a shot. Is uh, like, you talked about these small experiments that people could do to try and like wake up or wake up anytime they want and ditch the alarm and see how that feels. And, you know, you could kind of log that and, and do experiments on yourself to try and see what actually is making it make inferences about that black box inside you. But at some point, I kind of feel like you're talking about design, we're talking about these physiological things inside of us. Like what, what is the kind of, 
like, like, just like help, can you help us connect those dots and say, I would love to get more sleep. I understand that it's good for me, but I also get stuck on that thing of, of you know, there's too much to do and it's complex to, to let go of that. Like how, how can design help with that? I kind of feel like that's where you're getting at. That's what you're telling us to do. And well, what <laughs> can you offer? Would, would that I could simply tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, no, from a design point of view, yeah. One of the things about, we, we did a, a five week focused exploration about why do we eat? That was a series of explorations of experiments, five experiments over six weeks actually. And again, the, it depends on the person. I mean, uh, if they want to engage with this, but the opportunity that we provided was to say, look, there, let's ask the question, why do we eat? And if you want to eat to feel and burn better, that was the proposition, eat, burn better is what it was called. It wasn't about fat loss, it was about learning how eating actually works. Then these kind of experiments that we're talking about don't really necessarily have to take a lot of time. Like the first experiment that we did in the eat, burn better, series that the thing supported was explore what fullness feels like. Do you even know when you feel full or what that takes when you're, when you're eating a meal? And we looked at the principle that it takes 20 minutes for your brain to get the signal that you, you've been eating something. So how can you use that signal to help understand fullness? And from that, we were able to build on, okay, let's try eating these types of foods, what we call reds and greens, focus on that for a week after that. And by building these progressions and spending time here, here's a big help is that you don't ask somebody to just do it. We usually set up something on one week and also talk about preparing for what's coming the following week. So, and again, this isn't special to HCI. This has been around in the psychological literature for ages when you're trying to help people explore different behaviors is, and that's why I hate talking about behavior change. If you if you don't know how to do it, how can you change your behavior? It's if, But if you learn something, so is learning to cook a football better, uh, behavior change, anyway, pet peeve. Um, so two things there is, one is make preparation accessible. Two is that the experiment itself is time limited. So when you can say to somebody, you're only doing this thing for five days and it will take doing this, how do you prepare for that? That's one, one bit of two things. The other part of that is offer people choice. Again, our sleep stuff gave people nine different experiments. Kill the alarm was one. They agreed to try three over a period of 14 days. So they were swapping experiments every five days. And the idea of the design of those experiments was looking at the literature and science of finding the things that can have the fastest benefit over the shortest period of time. So you're only asking somebody to be weird for a short period of time so that they can experience the effect of it. Also framing it as an experiment to say, this is not something you would do in normal life. This is just really highly specialized, like a lab. You're a scientist here. You're running the experiment and experiments are weird. So here's a way to access that um, approach. I hope that I hope that helps a little bit. So that it's not like change your life forever, do this forever at all. It's it's short, sharp, shocked, and you choose and you can look at the preparation and say, oh, if I'm gonna do this green experiment, how do I make sure I have enough greens? What does that look like in my house four or five days? So it sounds like one of the things you're saying is uh, teach people how, what, what design can do is teach people or support people in doing experiments on themselves. And like you just- That is, if you take a look at that experiment in a box paper, and I hope you do, you will see that that, that, that is a, a key part of the structure. And that's also what would be in, how do you put that into a, an app, into a box, into some support um, peripheral design stuff to make that as easy as possible for people to succeed at. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Karen. Um, chat from steve okay. do we have anyone else in the room because otherwise i can i'm happy to read out the question okay see you karen Go ahead. um okay so steve says really interesting theoretical models based in human physiology to guide the design but can you talk about how you see evaluating design from this perspective should hci researchers use blood tests or other ways of measuring 
biomarkers in our systems evaluations? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. And I have always wanted to be the first HCI researchers to draw blood in a study. So <laughs> you, you can totally go up for that if you can get the training and the licensure to do that or, or borrow somebody who has it. It's really cool. I mean, we do that kind of stuff all the time. We put heart rate, it's just non-invasive usually because again, we don't have the licensure for poking people in that way. But we do put biosensors on people all the time. What's your temperature? What's your heart rate? What's your HRV? What's your EEG? I mean, we're measuring stuff all the time. So go for it if you want. In this particular context, the way that we have been validating stuff is how do you feel how you feel is, is we're trying to, to help people get in touch with the way we're doing this. Our technology is, the internal technology is try to use technology to help you connect with the internal technology. We talk about it as sensors, blood tests, and that sort of thing are outsourcing um, how you're feeling to, to let the data tell you how you're feeling as opposed to figuring out how you're feeling yourself and learning how to tune that. So that's why I broke up with my Apple Watch actually, is that I was sick of relying on it to tell me how well I was doing something or not, rather than, you know, how do I feel? Can I tune how well I feel? So in this case, like the, the eating thing that we did, what we were looking at, what we we're interested in is people's own sense of, you know, I, I did this, this part of eating this thing. We got to a point where people were eating so well that, that the, one of the things they were doing was not eating for 13 hours, effectively overnight. And why the 13 hours, again, was related to Saturn's research and showing that 13 hours is the time we need. It's not about weight loss and fasting for weight loss. It was about the time that the body needs to switch to different gene signaling to do the repair it needs to heal itself to be ready to go the next day, part of that circadian connection. And also giving people that rationale for why they would be doing this was like, cool. And so they would report and say, you know what? I thought I was going to be starving and I wouldn't be able to do this 13 hour thing, but it was easy after X and Y before that. And so that kind of empowerment, feeling, knowing what to do, getting some understanding of how that was working in their bodies was way more powerful than blood work. And here's why, because when we've done this work with other communities, I now have enough of them logged, if you will, in terms of teaching these things, either as courses or running them as studies, for them to say, you know, X years now later, I'm still practicing whatever this heuristic was that I learned. Not all of them, not all the time, uh, but they still have that knowledge, skills, and practice that they are drawing on for their quality of life, and they can teach others. So, um, that's to me for, again, that's kind of the way of HCI. This is not something I'm necessarily recommending to you in terms of if you need to get a publication, but in terms of helping people's lives, giving them skills that they feel empowered by, that they don't have to rely on an app or a battery to tell them how they're doing, for my way of thinking is a good thing. But go ahead, blood tests, awesome. If you get to do that on your own, I, I will cheer. Uh, thanks, MC. Do we have uh, other questions uh, in the room? I, I have a follow-up question, but I don't want to over. I don't think so, and I think it's around time to wrap. So go okay, ahead, so Joanna. I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask one last question, and then we'll 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 wrap for those who really really have to go. But so just following up a little bit on your let me frame it as poo pooing behavior change um, models. Um, which is probably a bit of a, possibly an overstatement, but just to make a point. Um, so my understanding of behavior change models that like one of the first stages in behavior change is awareness, right? So you, you, you have to become aware that, oh, maybe sitting for eight hours a day actually isn't, doesn't make me feel good, but you're building up that, that awareness and you're only going to change your behavior once your awareness has, has, uh, uh, been improved. Um, and so it sounds to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like a lot of where your current work is and thinking is going is about how to run these experiments, especially kind of, this is a somewhat following up with Karen's, but um, somewhat run these experiments, these rapid experiments, there's not too huge of a commitment to build people's awareness such that their behavior might change. And But isn't that all part of, the whole behavior change um, approach or what am I missing? 
Uh, these are the kind of arguments I have. Eric uh, Heckler is a psychologist um, that I work with, and he is far more the expert and is not afraid to say the term behavior change. The reason, I guess, Joanne, I'm not sure how well this is going to answer your question, but the reason that, that I kind of challenge us around uh, going to behavior change is that that doesn't necessarily engage with our infrastructure. So the question, as you mentioned, sitting, which is fantastic. You know, we, we know that that's not a great thing to do. We know a lot of people do it, that maybe they don't know just how mm -hmm. deadly it can be. And uh, of course, there's debate just like there is about smoking. It's like, no, that won't kill you. Not today, maybe. Um, and yeah, the, the poison is the dose. The dose is the poison, as Mithridates found out. Anyway. Um, it's, I guess the challenge is for me is, is on the one hand is, well, what if we, in terms of future work, for example, what if you didn't have to worry about sitting because sitting wasn't what you did eight hours a day or standing in one spot doing repetitive motions at a machine isn't what you did all day in a dark warehouse with poor illumination? What if work was designed so that it was aligned with, with how we feel? So I guess I don't think about it as changing behavior so much as opening up options. It's, it's, I think of it more like coaching. It's like, here is how, this is what you want to do. Here is how you might uh, build some skills to be able to do what you want to do better. And so if you can learn how these things, if you can, yes, build your awareness to learn how these things make you feel and learn what some of the choices are, then you, you can do whatever you want. And I'm not sure if that's, necessarily called behavior change, which seems to be, here's the behavior to change, um, which seems to treat people like they're bad. You're doing something bad. I mean, the whole behavior change thing came out of, out of literature, people who were not well, who were dealing with addiction. And so it's just, I, I, let's set that aside. Let's forget that and just say, where are we going in terms of, do we want to design environments in which we don't have to change behaviors because health is supported out of the box? I think that's a good thing. In the meantime, how can we help people literally feel how they feel better so that they can say, I, I, I know that if I eat these greens, I'll, I'll feel more energy tomorrow morning, but I don't feel like doing it tonight. I'm gonna have cake and I know I'm gonna pay for it tomorrow, but it's worth it for whatever the social engagement context may be. It's, 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 opening up the palette of choices in a more informed way, maybe something like that. Great. That's actually really helpful. Um, <laughs> okay. Fantastic. It's, to me, to again, me I, I would, I would frame that as it's, it's bigger than behavior change. I mean, behavior change yeah. is part of it, but it's actually bigger sure. than that. Um, you know, it I might, like that bigger. Yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's broader. Um, of course, we need to empower people to be able to change the world in which they live, not just their behaviors within that world. But well, yeah, um, it's a place to start. Um, I think I have to end the formal discussion there for those folks that are uh, too plagued to get up and go, but really do need to move on for their um, uh, one thirty in Vancouver time. Um, so I do want to say an absolute um, large um, and warm thank you to MC for joining us. I know it's late for you, um, so we appreciate you uh, fitting us into your, your time. Um, the whole piece honor. on the future of work uh, links into <laughs> some work that we're doing, as I know I can see some of my collaborators here on Zoom. Um, in the future of work, longer discussions to be had. Um, You've, uh, as always, given a very thought-provoking uh, talk um, and stuff for us to, to really cogitate on deeply. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, MC, and uh, we hope to see you back in BC at some point. Anytime, anywhere. Thank you guys for, for spending some time, and let's keep the door open. Conversation is good. Absolutely. And thanks, Dongwook and Alina for setting us up uh, in the room. Absolutely. And, Thank you uh, so much for managing yeah, that. For managing uh, the technology. You'd think we'd have it all straight by now, but it's never straight. So, but we got it going. So thanks everybody <laughs> and have a great uh, rest of your afternoon.